Switching gears here a little bit, um, we're going to talk about cells making use of materials and how they do that and what are some energy requirements. Um, so let's just get going with it. We're going to introduce a word, metabolism. Metabolism is defined as all of the chemical reactions that are taking place inside of an organism. Okay, so there are lots of different chemical reactions taking place. We've already seen a little bit of that. And if we look specifically within a cell, um, each cell even has a lot of chemical reactions taking place. A lot of these reactions are linked together into what we would call metabolic pathways. So a pathway, this just means like we start with one molecule, modify it a little bit, then it's another molecule, modify it a little bit more, then it's another molecule, so on and so forth. It's a pathway. And pathways, metabolic pathways in cells, they can either be linear like this, or they can be cyclical. So one, uh, one molecule would enter into this cycle and something would leave, the rest of the molecule would continue on. So it kind of forms a cycle. We're gonna see some examples of both of these. Um, just wanna start with that kind of general introduction, get the idea going in your mind. Okay, metabolic pathways can be used to build things, so build molecules, um, assemble larger molecules from smaller starting ingredients, for example, or we could use metabolic pathways to break things down. And the word for those two, uh, the words for those two are on the slide here, anabolism versus catabolism. Catabolism, think of it like a catastrophe, something is getting broken down, versus anabolism, something is being built up. So anabolism, this requires an input of energy. Catabolism generally doesn't. Generally, this is something that releases energy. So we would perform catabolism on food molecules in order to release the energy from those food molecules. Okay, so in order to do all of this, um, so let's say a, a cell is trying to build something up, an anabolic pathway. Where does it get the energy that it needs in order to do that? Mostly our cells get energy from glucose and glucose is something that um, can be stored. There are ways to store it in the body so that we can have easy access to it later, even if we're not um, like constantly eating. <laughs> okay, so if glucose isn't available, there are other molecules that can be used. We'll see that a little bit later on. But what we're gonna do right now for this next section, we're really gonna focus in on glucose and how energy can be harvested from it. It turns out from one molecule of glucose, we can get about 36 molecules of ATP. That's quite a few ATP molecules. We're gonna see how that happens. It's going to take place through a four step process. There are four different stages. Uh, glycolysis, the preparatory step, citric acid cycle, and then finally the electron transport system. And um, these last three, these all take place inside of a mitochondria. Okay, so the first one, glycolysis, this happens out in the cytoplasm of the cell. The glycolysis will make a little bit of ATP, uh, but then these other three steps, these all take place in the mitochondria, and this is where most of the ATP production will happen. Okay, so overall perspective here, what we should have in mind is that we're gonna be using a molecule of glucose. We'll run that through the process of cellular respiration, which involves these steps. And what that's going to do for us is generate 36 molecules of ATP. What those molecules of ATP can be used for is then cellular work. We can do it, uh, we can use those ATP molecules to transport things or to power anabolic pathways. Uh, lots of different things that can, can come from those ATP molecules. Okay, so let's start off with glycolysis. We're gonna go through these four stages, starting with glycolysis. Glycolysis, again, is something that takes place in the cytoplasm. And what happens during glycolysis is that the glucose molecule that we start with gets split in half. In order to do that, we have to put in a tiny bit of energy. This requires two molecules of ATP in order to split the glucose in half. But then in the end, we end up getting four ATP molecules back out of this process. So the net result is that we generate two ATPs, essentially. We also generate a couple of other molecules. 
um, in the process of breaking the glucose apart, that frees up some electrons and some protons, some hydrogen ions, and those things get picked up by what's called a coenzyme. A coenzyme is literally something that helps an enzyme to do its job. So the coenzyme that we're talking about here is NAD+. And when it picks up the electrons and hydrogen ions, what it becomes is NADH. So this is a molecule. We're not going to say a whole lot more about it right now. I just kind of want you to let that hang out in the background. This is going to show up later on in the process. We'll come back to NADH later on. So in the end, uh, we started with glucose. We ended up with two molecules of pyruvate. That's what the glucose gets split in half to become, is pyruvate. Next up, those pyruvates are going to head into the next stage here. So next we have what's called the preparatory step. This is getting the pyruvates ready for the next step in the process. The preparatory step happens inside of the mitochondria, in the fluid of the mitochondria. And basically, each pyruvate um, gets kind of, it's, some people say it's a grooming process. It gets one carbon snipped off of it. And um, what ends up happening is that the end result, so carbon leaves, um, the end result is a molecule that gets attached to another coenzyme, coenzyme A, and the end result is called acetyl-CoA. So this is a molecule with two carbons now, and it's ready to enter the next stage of the process. Notice we also make another molecule of NADH, so we'll come back to that again later. Um, something to keep in mind with this process is that there are actually two molecules of pyruvate that go through this process, right? Because we started with one molecule of gluco glucose, it got split in half, so we have two molecules of pyruvate, and they each go through this preparatory step. Okay, so in the end, acetyl-CoA is going to head to the next part of the process. This is called the citric acid cycle. So here's a cyclical pathway. Um, older textbooks might call this the Krebs cycle. It's the same thing. Okay, we'll call it the citric acid cycle. This is the, the more um, common term, I believe, these days. So still, this is taking place in the mitochondria. And what happens is acetyl-CoA enters into this cycle. And basically, it gets completely disassembled. So um, carbon dioxide gets pulled off of it. The carbons are removed, and in the process we make more NADH, we also make a molecule of ATP, and then there's one other thing right here, we haven't seen this one before, we make a molecule of FADH2. This is another coenzyme that's going to come back up on the next slide. It's another one that's carrying high energy electrons and protons, um, kind of acting like a shuttle molecule. All right. So, let's see what these guys are going to do. Next up, we have the electron transport system. This is a system that's embedded inside of the mitochondria in the membrane. See all those membrane folds that mitochondria have? Um, there's something really important going on on those folds. So coming over here, let's take a look at what's taking place. It turns out those membranes, those internal membranes, have a bunch of proteins embedded in them. And what's going to happen here is the molecules of NADH and FADH2 that we produced in the earlier stages, they are going to come over and dump off their electrons with those proteins. Okay, so here's an NADH molecule. It gives up its electron, and that electron gets passed from one protein to the next. Okay, you see that? It just kind of gets passed along. And as it goes, What's it doing? It's actually giving off some of its energy. The high energy electron gives off some of its energy to the protein, and that protein is going to use that energy in order to pump a proton across the membrane. Okay, see that each of these proteins is acting as a pump. They're each pumping hydrogen ions across. So what we get is a buildup of hydrogen ions on this side of the membrane, inside of the mitochondria. Now, what are those hydrogen ions going to do? They kind of act like water that's stored up behind a dam. There's a lot of energy stored in this hydrogen ion gradient. And what's going to happen is those hydrogen ions will flood back through this protein. This one is called ATP synthase. So as they rush through, 
what they do is they power the synthesis of ATP. This is a special protein, it's actually an enzyme, ATP synthase, and what it does is it takes a phosphate group and attaches it onto ADP, thereby making ATP. Okay, so this hydrogen gradient, hydrogen ion gradient, powers the production of ATP by ATP synthase. This is a really fascinating system. It's a really complex system too. This is one to take some time with um, in order to make sure that you're understanding what's going on. It's pretty complex. Okay, that electron that we started off with, that we said gets handed down the protein chain here, in the end, where does it go? It actually gets handed off to oxygen and ends up forming a water molecule. Okay, my camera just died, so we're gonna finish this out without the camera. Um, all right, so yeah, let's take a look at a recap. So cellular respiration is what this process is called. Um, cellular respiration, again, it allows us to make about 36 ATP molecules in total from one glucose. And most of that ATP comes from right here. ATP synthase inside of the mitochondria is what's making that ATP. So a recap. Again, we started off with one molecule of glucose. And through the process of glycolysis, we split that in half to make two pyruvates. Pyruvate heads off to the preparatory step. Um, gets groomed and becomes acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle and after that all these electron shuttle molecules NADH and FADH2, those were those were uh, molecules that get produced uh, they head off to the electron transport chain inside of the mitochondria and end up helping uh, ATP synthase to make a bunch of ATP. Okay, so in total, about 36 ATP molecules get produced from this one starting glucose molecule. All right, um, okay, so that's if we start with glucose. What happens if glucose is not available inside of a cell? There are other things that can be used too, so fats and proteins, we can also break those down and get energy from them. And there's kind of an interesting mapping here. Um, if we start with fats, essentially what happens is the fat gets broken down and ends up entering the cycle right here. So we would continue on through the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system. Um, so there's no, no glycolysis in that case. Um, we just kind of jump into the pathway a little bit later on. Same idea for other substances like proteins. If we break those down, Ultimately, they can enter the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system still works as well um, as long as oxygen is present. So on that note, what happens if oxygen isn't present? What if we don't have enough oxygen um, in our blood in order to power all of this taking place? In that case, we can get by for a very short time doing something called anaerobic metabolism, so no oxygen involved. And in that case, what happens is pyruvate gets converted to a molecule called lactic acid. And this is something that can build up in muscles if you're working out really hard and your body can't quite keep up with the oxygen, um, providing enough oxygen to muscles. Lactic acid can build up and it can cause things like cramping and a lot of discomfort. Um, but what this what this allows, let me just back up for a little bit here. What this allows is for glycolysis to continue to take place. So ordinarily, oxygen is needed over here, um, but even if oxygen is not available, we can still make a little bit of ATP just by doing glycolysis. So if there's no oxygen available, essentially that's what happens. By converting pyruvate to lactic acid, it frees up glycolysis to, to keep taking place.